says now whenever I... Uh, we're going to ask everyone to um, mute, if you wouldn't mind, just so that we can cut down on the on the uh, uh, crosstalk. And um, um, to kick things off um, and to introduce our first speaker, um, I'm so glad to uh, hand things over to our um, still our new uh, provost and vice president for academic affairs, uh, Dr. Margaret Everett. Margaret. Thanks so much, uh, Jason. Hi, everyone. It is really great to see such a, a great turnout tonight. I'm going to keep my remarks brief and introduce our speaker in a minute. But um, let me start by saying thank you sincerely to all of you who've joined together tonight for, for this presentation, our inaugural, inaugural presentation in uh, the series on Hidden Truths. Um, and I, I want to say a special thank you to all the people who have put this series together and I'm, I'm sure that I'm not going to name everyone. So my apologies in advance, but uh, Laura DeMore, Jason Jacobs, Laura Turner, Brian Hendrickson, thank you all so much for the work you've put into this. I'm really proud of our faculty uh, for stepping up at a really critical time in our community and in our country, frankly, um, and putting together a really meaningful series that I think is gonna allow us to have some really important dialogue over the next um, several months. So as I said, tonight is the first in a series of presentations and discussions about local histories. We're all aware of the national context in which we're all called on um, with appropriate uh, urgency to reckon with racial injustice and a history of systematic oppression. And I see in that context really a mosaic of thousands of local stories, often marginalized, hidden, dismissed, misrepresented. I'm so grateful, as I said, to our faculty, to our alumni, our community partners for putting together this vital series. And I really believe that facing the truths of our past and present though painful is really a positive foundation for action toward a more inclusive and just future. How we remember what we remember really matters in material ways, I believe. So thanks again to everyone who's helped put this together. Thank you all for joining us. And it's really my pleasure to welcome tonight's pre presenter, who's a fellow anthropologist, so it's a special pleasure. Jeremy Campbell is, uh, Dr. Jeremy Campbell is an Associate Professor of Anthropology. I bet a lot of you know him well at Roger Williams University and the Director of the University Honors Program. Dr. Campbell specializes in land conflicts and environmental politics in the Brazilian Amazon, where he's conducted ethnographic research alongside indigenous peoples and other traditional communities for the past 20 years. His lecture tonight will explore the history of the Poconocet Nation, the original inhabitants of the Bristol and Greater East Bay area and their ancestral land. So with that, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Campbell. Thank you very much, uh, Provost Everett. Um, thank you for that warm introduction. And uh, let me just underline one thing that you uh, said, uh, that how we remember what we remember is so vital and I think that might be a nice way into the material today. Um, thank you so much um, Dr. Diamore, Dr. Turner, Dean Jacobs, Dr. Hendrickson for all the hard work and for the invitation. It's a privilege to uh, be given the task of starting off this year-long series called Hidden Truths, uh, Stories of Race and Place. Um, and uh, let me just take a moment to share my screen, sorry, before I get <laughs> too far away. Um, here we go. Hopefully you all don't mind me taking control of your screen for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, so thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you, Provost Everett, again. Uh, the title of my talk uh, is, is uh, before you right now, Decolonizing Soams, Resisting the Erasure of Indigenous Lives in the East Bay of Rhode Island. And um, uh, I think it's appropriate since uh, the Hidden Truth series uh, invites us to uh, sort of uh, um, excavate and really consider some of those stories and some of those truths that may have been marginalized or, or hidden from view, those thousand uh, at least stories of, of place um, that we bump into or ignore um, in our daily lives. I think it would be absolutely appropriate for us to start 
uh, tonight with um, an acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples, peoples plural, uh, that uh, con continue to inhabit are the history of uh, the, the lands that Roger Williams University calls home, but, are con but continue to be here as well. So um, I'm going to read this land acknowledgement and then say just a little bit about it before diving into uh, give you kind of an overview of what I hope um, we can talk about tonight. Uh, I should also say that um, uh, thank you for being muted. Thank you for not sharing your video, but do uh, familiarize yourself with the chat feature. The chat feature is open to all. Uh, so if you have questions, uh, you can go ahead and, and pop them into the chat. Probably not going to be referring to them until the end when we get to the Q&A. Um, that would be a, something to, to avail yourself of for sure. So, we recognize the unique and enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. We acknowledge that Roger Williams University's Bristol and Providence campuses are located within the homelands of both the Poconoket and Narragansett nations. Let this acknowledgement serve as a reminder of our ongoing efforts to reconcile and partner with the, po with the Narragansett and Poconoket and all indigenous peoples whose lands and water benefit from today. So uh, a land acknowledgement, as many of you know, um, is a sort of ceremonial, uh, a kind of ritual opening, a kind of first gasp before focus on the issue might be uh, in a meeting or in, um, uh, let's say, a commencement or some kind of big ceremonial event. It's a way to take a breath, take a pause, remember uh, and, and acknowledge and try to connect to stories that are in many cases ancient and deep, but also br that, that carry forth to the present, right? And so this is a statement that um, is the result of collective efforts, um, a partnership between uh, Roger Williams University students, faculty, administrators, uh, representatives of the Poconoket nations, rep uh, nation, representatives of the Narragansett nation, to, to try to really lean into that, the, the legacy and the continued um, sort of vibrancy of Indigenous peoples here in Rhode Island. Um, this, I'm happy to say that this um, land acknowledgement or versions of it appear in faculty syllabi. Uh, they are be be being used at events like this, conferences and whatnot. And um, as a university, I think we're, we're reckoning with kind of the commitments that, that a statement like this could um, be, be bringing us into. So it's a very exciting thing to, to sort of start off with. And of course, content appropriate today um, as we talk about decolonizing SOEMs. So four things that are, that are kind of the, the main objectives of my talk tonight. Uh, the first thing will be to, to really dive into what we mean when we say decolonization and its various cognates, to decolonize a place or decolonize so What is it and what does it, and, and how does it matter? Uh, why should this be something that, that we in the university or we in society more generally generally should be concerning ourselves with. Then, you know, I'll answer the question and try to, you know, catch you up on if you don't know what exactly we mean by SOAMS, what, what that refers to as a, as a place name. Uh, then I'll present uh, a brief overview, uh, there's 400 plus years kind of uh, in six slides, uh, a history of the Poconoket Nation uh, to provide you with some of the vital uh, stories, some of the vital context that perhaps um, you didn't know you didn't know. Uh, being a uh, resident of Bristol or being, uh, you know, new to Roger Williams, uh, the history of the Poconoket Nation um, is in some ways um, a, 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 an incredibly important history to understand to be a Rhode Islander or what it means to be indeed an American uh, because of the role that the Poconoket Nation played uh, in colonial times. But again, I want to stress that their vibrancy and their vitality continues down through the 21st century. Um, so with those stories um, sort of brought to light, the final thing we'll do is look at Bristol and surrounding areas uh, anew with some of those hidden truths in mind. Um, since I'm an educator and as well as a researcher, I, I live by the, the credo that you really can't learn much from someone whom you can't um, identify with or kind of connect to. So I want to tell you a little bit about me um, by, by by way of beginning, I want to say that the story that I'm about to tell is not my story. Um, it's not by, by, any, by any means anywhere close to, to my story. But I do tell this story with the full permission and encouragement of the Poconoke Nation. Um, in these lands, I'm a settler. I've lived here for 11 years. Um, and in that time, I've had the privilege of coming to know more about this place than 
photographs first meets the eye. Um, but this is not my story, uh, nor is it my realm of academic expertise. I, uh, as the provost said, I'm an Amazonianist. Uh, I work uh, as an outsider, uh, again, owning my position with indigenous peoples on a range of issues in the Brazilian Amazon, which include things like land titling and um, environmental, uh, environmental threats, their responses to environmental threats. Um, but, but even within that context, um, there, there's very little in my professional life that prepares me to speak with authority on decolonizing so on. So instead of speaking with authority, I speak as a settler, one of millions of settlers in this country who enjoy privileges that arise as the result of the historic and ongoing oppression of indigenous peoples in this continent. Um, so I wanna squarely sort of own that position and I encourage you to as well. I, I'm presuming, perhaps it's folly, but I'm presuming that many of you are settlers as well, um, it, depending, and, and we can unpack that term a little bit as well. Uh, but from settler to settler, I want to invite you to um, consider some of what I'm offering here. Uh, and all of what I'm offering here uh, is the result of a year plus long collaboration that I've had um, together with my students in the honors program and in the anthropology program, together with colleagues like Charlotte Carrington Farmer and Brian Hendrickson, um, and together with community groups uh, like the um, SOAMS, uh, SOAMS Area Heritage Project, um, we've collaborated with the tribe to begin to try to aid their efforts, uh, the Poconoke Nation's efforts, to publicize their story, to bring their story more to the front because Many Bristolians, many Rhode Islanders um, simply don't know it. So um, everything that I'm going to say tonight has, has been the result of meetings, interviews, documentary sorts of deep dives into the material and oral history of a people. And it's my um, humble privilege to be able to share it. Um, during the question and answer, I'm gonna tell you what I know and I'm gonna defer when I don't know, because again, this is not my story and I think that's important. It's important um, in part because owning the identity or owning the stance as a settler invites you to sort of consider what it might, might mean to decolonize your life or to decolonize your institution or decolonize your sensibility about history, the histories that matter, the histories that, 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 tell, that shape our lives. And uh, to sort of explain and explore a little bit more what decolonization means, it's helpful to take a cue from the two scholars who, whom you see in the upper left of, of your screen, Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang, uh, who are indigenous scholars in the field of critical indigenous studies. Uh, and they remind us um, very sort of passionately that decolonization takes work. Um, it takes material striving. It takes the effort to consider what you might not know you don't know. And in that way, decolonization is not a metaphor. It can't be sort of suffused in other sorts of um, well-meaning justice-oriented work, um, which is no slight against justice-oriented work or collaboration or, or solidarity, but decolonization is a very specific um, way of talking about how we need to become more aware of how settler colonialism has, um, has, has sprung into existence, has, has, has supported institutions that continue again to or, or shield from view indigenous realities. So decolonization at its heart interrupts the logic of settler colonialism. Um, and that, that term, um, bear with me with that term, that, that one's a little bit confusing, but, but essentially what settler colonialism does without us even knowing it is that it sort of posits a view. It, it sets out a sort of understanding, implicit often, but also explicit in the teachings uh, that we give our for example, kindergarten through 12th grade um, sort of education curriculum in this country, the view that indigenous peoples are either vanquished and somehow in the past, right, always referred to in the past tense, or readily or, or just about to be assimilated into the value systems of the broader society. Um, and, and of course, that broader society that we you know, default to of what kind of country we are, what, what the United States is, um, is a society whose institutions, courts, police, the educational system, private property are made by and for settlers. 
and and I would go farther, and, and I think later on in this series, you'll you'll be able to grapple with histories whereby it's not just that settlers benefit from courts, police, education system, private property, but certain kinds of settlers at certain certain historical junctures, right? So an intersectional sort of approach to these questions is absolutely baked into uh, the, the decolonial work. Um, but it's it's grappling first with what settler colonialism um, is all about and the ways in which it sets us up to perhaps um, presume that indigenous peoples are um, all gone, uh, historical in the past tense, or somehow um, sort of half citizens. Um, so to, to kind of quickly compare settler history, what we all learn often, kind of orthodox history, sets colonialism as a discrete historical event, something that's in the past, right? So if we're thinking of North American history, we might say 1776 is the end of the colonial era. If we're a little bit, we might say, well, you know, the United States was still just hugging the Atlantic coastline. And so the era of manifest destiny in the 19th century is colonial sort of uh, epic as well. But as soon as that's finished, it's again in the past. Um, indigenous perspectives see co colonization as a continuous process, something that is continuing to happen. Uh, and it takes uh, the following forms at minimum. One is that colonization includes indigenous histories from view. So occlusion is, is the act of kind of covering up or, or looking away from, right? So the history is still there. It's still, it's still able to be perceived, but um, you got to go out of your way. You got to know who to talk to. You got to make outstanding efforts um, because it's not part of our public discussion of history. Um, so that's a, that's a colonial process. Um, colonization continues to um, see indigenous lands. It, it perpetuates this idea that indigenous lands are national sacrifice zones. Uh, for example, the Dakota Access Pipeline, right? Sacrificing um, the indigenous land and indigenous you know, understandings of land to the greater good of the country's economic uh, development, right? Uh, or out west uh, in the Nevada test site range, uh, where Shoshone and Ute uh, territory sacred sites uh, have been blasted by nuclear tests, um, nuclear tests over the years. Um, so seeing indigenous lands as sacrifice zones, as places that really are too big for so few people. So, and we've got 330 million people. So let's just take their land and you know do what we want with it. Um, they, these are continual processes again. Oh, sorry. Um, and then finally. Uh, Colonization through indigenous eyes is a continuous process because it continues to parody, denigrate, or uh, really affect violence on indigenous bodies. Uh, there's an epidemic in this continent of um, missing and kidnapped um, and murdered indigenous women um, throughout the continent. Um, not, not just talking about a, about a particular place, right? And that story gets occluded from view, but there's also colonial structures that continue to perpetuate that sort of violence. Um, uh, the parodying of indigenous bodies, the um, uh, mascots, uh, both at, prof at the professional level, but also many of your high schools perhaps, kind of treating culture as this kind of pantomime sort of thing that can be um, uh, you know, easily sort of poked fun at. Um, so, so these are ways, again, which, in which colonization has not uh, ended. So a useful way to think about colonization, and this might be new for many of us, is that it's not an event, it's a process. It's not something that happened and then was over, but instead it's a continuous process. And one thing I like to say is that if we're really interested in decolonization, then the first step for us is to understand how colonization and the colonial context kind of provides us ways to think about the, the continued marginalization and the continued kind of um, dispossession of native peoples, right? So once we understand that colonization is ongoing, we can sort of understand how we are complicit in those processes, which are processes of public memory, they're processes of enjoying the privileges of a, of a settler, of a, of a settler co uh, colonial democracy, like private property, like the ability to vote, like my ability to easily move to a new state, right, uh, 11 years ago, and because I wanted to sort of begin to research the history, but that itself is a privilege, a privilege of, of access, a privilege of being 
able to move my capital <laughs> from one place to another, meager as it was, right, and, and invest in a new place. Uh, so uh, it, this, this way of thinking, this lens begins to open up ways to think about how we can untangle the legacies of colonialism that continue to accrue privileges for some um, while marginalizing and ostracizing others. Some of the things that we need to consider then is who gets to decide the history that our public places tell. Um, the, the image on the right here of the 4th of July parade um, in 2018 in Bristol. Uh, Bristol has a very sort of clear story of itself that is abundantly clear when you've come as a first time visitor, right? The red, white, and blue stripe down, the, down uh, Hope Street and down High Street, the bunting, uh, the, the beautiful manicured lawns, it feels like a colonial um, sort of paradise, almost like a colonial Disneyland and very patriotic, right? Almost as if downtown, the clock has been set to 1776 or shortly after the revolution. That's on purpose. That's the result of particular choices that people are making and that people have become accustomed to. It ends up sort of marginalizing or occluding other forms of history, other stories that are, I would offer, as important, if not more important than that particular congratulatory image of Bristol that, that Bristol puts out, that, East, that the East Bay puts out, that Rhode Island puts out for that matter. Um, so who gets to decide what our public history looks like? This is exactly the story that, that or the, exactly the question that's being pursued uh, in the streets uh, as C Christopher Columbus statues come down, as um, Confederate statues uh, become either, you know, either torn down or recontextualized. Right? Um, so, so it's very relevant to broader themes. Um, this question, does living on stolen land bestow special obligations on us? This is a difficult question and one which we probably reject on its face because we don't have the kind of empathetic and, and maybe comparative muscles to sort of consider, oh wow, this land that I feel like I have a deed to or I feel like I've, I've paid my dues to, to achieve, what is its deeper history? What are, the, what are the continued valences through which it becomes meaningful to people other than me? Right? Does the gap between those two things then necessitate action on my part to work towards diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice? Because Indigenous Rhode Islanders are here uh, and they're now. They're not gone, right? They haven't been vanquished. So we would be good to ask what does decolonization mean to them and how can non-Indigenous settlers work in alliance with them to achieve some of those goals. So um, as promised, I want to get into kind of what SOAMS refers to. We've got a few um, watchwords, a few concepts that we can begin to work on, settler colonialism, um, decolonization as ways to try to work through and open our minds to knowing things that we might not have known uh, or, or things that we might have been taught a certain way, but um, here's another take on it that comes directly from indigenous uh, oral tradition and documentary evidence. Um, so so those are, that's, that's the in invitation. Now let's get down to some of the geography. I'm gonna show you a lot of maps. I'm also gonna go through, um, again, 400 years of history relatively quickly. Soams um, is, is a place name. It, it means southern country in the um, Eastern Algonquian dialects. Many of the Eastern Algonquian dialects have Soams or Soamsi, meaning place to the south, especially in the connotation of a place to the south near the water. So hopefully you can see here uh, Soams Bay uh, on, the eastern, on the western side here of this map. This is a 1908 map commissioned by the state of Rhode Island uh, by uh, Thomas W. Bicknell, he, he was the um, cartographer, to try to affix native place names to places um, in Rhode Island. Some of these place names are very much still with us, like Papa Squash Neck, uh, Tewissit Neck, um, Seekonk, of course, uh, a native place name, Pawtuck, um, Wachamaquacket up here. Uh, others have, have been lost to memory. Others have been reappropriated. Uh, but Soams generally refers to this area um, along the Soams Bay, uh, which would have been uh, the Poconoket um, and, and other native groups reference term for this body of water that we know today as Mount Hope Bay, or Narragansett Bay, sorry, Mount Hope Bay is over here. Uh, and specifically, a series of villages uh, in what's now Barrington, Warren, and then down into Bristol as well. So um, it was the, the, the sort of capital of the Poconoket Nation uh, at 
time of um, the arrival of the, of the pilgrims in the 17th century. Uh, one other sort of interesting note, and it's very important for what I'm, what I'm about to get into later on, is that on this map, down here where the asterisk, asterisk is, you'll see M-O-N-T-A-U-P given, uh, listed for what the Poconocet know as Patumtuck and what you may know as Mount Hope. So just to orient you, campus, the Roger Williams campus is here, right? And about two miles to the north northeast is a place that is now known as Mount Hope, Mount Hope Farm, which is a public park, uh, Bristol Town property. Um, it's sort of half of that area. The other half belongs to Brown University uh, and has uh, played various roles uh, over the years. Uh, but the, the Poconoke know this land as, as Patumtuck or lookout of the Poconoke. And indeed it is a lookout, it is a high bluff. Um, Montauk was probably, um, probably also used for the area, for, for, for that by other groups, um, non-Poconoke non groups, because Montauk means rise near the water. Um, it's related to Montauk. Uh, if, uh, down on the eastern uh, edge of, of Long Island, right? Um, so a bluff that overlooks the water is a montop, but Po Tumtuck is the rising place or the lookout of the Poconoket people. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be saying Poconoket, I'm sorry, I'm gonna be saying Patumtuck a lot tonight, and I'm referring to Mount Hope, which is again, just two miles up the road from uh, the Roger Williams University campus. The Poconoket in the 17th century, um, were an incredibly influential and important uh, tribe in a broader ecology of tribal nations in southern New England. And indeed, uh, the Eastern Algonquian speaking peoples stretched from um, New Brunswick in the north all the way down to the tidewater of Virginia, um, speaking the same language, not practicing exactly the same culture, and certainly not having um, isomorphic political systems that fit one into the other. But nevertheless, from New Brunswick all the way down to the tidewaters of Virginia and, and make your own way uh, using, um, using different varieties of a dialect that were mutually eligible and which come down today to us as the Eastern Algonquian languages. And so the Poconoke, you can see in this map from 1978, the Smithsonian Institution, uh, basically dominated the southeastern quadrant of New England, uh, including uh, this area, the Bristol Peninsula, uh, and, and areas around around here. Uh, the Narragansetts uh, were neighbors uh, and continue to be neighbors to the West. Um, the Massachusetts and the Nipmuc at various times paid tribute actually to the Poconoket. And the Poconoket kind of royal line was established in Soams. Oh dear, I hope, hope my connection's still good. Um, I'm just gonna keep talking until someone tells me that they can't hear me. So, um, so what we now know as Bristol, right, is, is the place where Massasoit Osamequin, Massasoit is a title, um, his son Massasoit Wamsutta took over uh, when Osamequin died. And when Wamsutta died, King Philip, Poe Medicom, and Medicom should ring a bell because Medicom Avenue became the next Massasoit. All residents of this place, all uh, principal sachems, principal leaders, great sachems, great leaders, Massasoits of the Poconoket Nation. So many different villages, many tributary peoples as well, who essentially paid tribute to the Poconoket Massasoits in return for um, uh, protection, in return for access to fields, in, in return for kinship um, relations, these sorts of things. So um, it's no accident uh, that we um, are sort of focused on them right now, because right now is also the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the pilgrims at Plymouth. So I'll point out Plymouth here on the map as well. And when the pilgrims arrived, they first interacted with Poconoket uh, natives um, who were dominant down through the Cape uh, and all the way up to uh, into Massachusetts. Um, at this point, it's only appropriate that we hear a little bit from the Poconoket and from the, the um, seated Sagamore, the, the head chief of the nation, Sagamore Po Wau P Niampog, uh, which translates to Winds of Thunder, Jim Bill Guy. He is the ninth great-grandson, uh, all documented, all the way back to Pometicom. Um, he's pictured here sitting in King Philip's seat at Patumtuck. And this uh, film, he's also seated at the seat of, of uh, King Philip, which was a, a, a traditional and continues to be a gathering place, a council place, where 
elders and powesses or, or medicine people um, would confer and deliberate certain things. It no doubt was at or near uh, King Philip's seat that King Philip's father, Osamequin, first learned of the arrival of the pilgrims in 1620 and first began to confer with um, his sachems and powers of this sort. So it's an incredibly important place, again, just two miles up the road. And uh, let's hear what the Sagamore has to say about the history of the Poconoke people. The history of the Poconoke tribe uh, actually uh, was the headship tribe of what you call the Wampanoag Nation today. But when the English came to this country, this whole area was known as Poconoke country or King Philip country later on. Any map prior to the King Philip War will stay right on it, Poconoke country. So uh, Wampanoag is a name that was given to us uh, during the King Philip War around the year 1675, 1676 when the colonists outlawed the word Poconoke and made it illegal for you, if you were male 14 years of age or older, to say you were Poconoke. And they started calling us Wampanoag at that time. And that was uh, a law that was on the books until after the year 2000. And if you were 14 years of age or older and you were male, they would kill you on sight if you said you were Poconoke. They could kill you on sight. So basically, uh, the word of uh, Poconoke, a lot of people don't recognize. But that, this is who we are. And just uh, last year, we took back Poconoke Nation. Right. So um, again, Sagamore, uh, Winds of Thunder, presenting uh, just a little bit about that, that moment, the kind of earth shattering moment of Poconoke interactions with um, settlers from, from England, right? Um, it, it turned out to be a tragic uh, sort of story, uh, but it didn't start out as a tragic story. And, and even before we get to that singular event that is King Philip's War, we need to set maybe an even broader context, which is that um, 12,000 years before the present, uh, just as the, the Laurentide glacial ice sheet was retreating back from Long Island and Block Island and, and heading north, um, Archaeological evidence suggests that the ancestors of contemporary uh, Algonquian-speaking groups uh, began to move into this area, um, first as foragers and in due succession um, as settlers themselves, as, as complex agriculture. Um, these cultures, by the time of the 15th and 16th century, uh, right on the eve of the arrival of Euro Europeans, are distinguished from, from New Brunswick down to Virginia by general cultural characteristics. They are agriculturalists, uh, which means they plant um, and eat their food. They're not nomads. Um, uh, and the, the principal diet uh, subs uh, consists of the three sisters, or corn, beans, and squash, in addition to um, things that uh, indigenous peoples would forage, uh, clams, hunting, um, um, useful, use useful fruits, uh, or ed edible plants, these sorts of things. Um, they, they encouraged foraging and encouraged the bounty of foraging through manipulating the landscape through the use of fire. Um, indigenous peoples have, throughout the continent and, and in South America as well, enriched their surroundings by the strategic use of fire uh, to then encourage edge habitats, to encourage the return of fauna and flora that they um, you know, wanted uh, to, to be consuming. Uh, they were seasonally mig migratory, meaning that summer camps would be close to the water. Winter camps, which were smaller in number, would be closer inland. Um, complex political systems um, involving tribute, involving um, inter interlocking kin obligations, and indeed webs of relations, not just among differing tribes and differing factions of tribes, but relations were recognized and responsibilities were recognized to non-human relations as well. Um, so it, it, that's, that's part of how we begin to understand the putative uh, closeness of indigenous peoples to nature is that there's an even divide or a neat kind of um, dichotomy between humans and non-humans. Um, non-humans were seen as agents and understood as being, being uh, possessive of, of of free will in many cases as well. And that became part of a kind of cosmovision, but also a political system um, that's when we think about, okay, we wanna decolonize, um, what, what might that mean? 
perspective. So, so this, this is the kind of broader historical and cultural um, context. And then the, the pilgrims come, and I don't want to bore you with those details, uh, just to say that it is important, uh, again, for United States, and I would offer global history, that it's a Poconocet leader, the Massasoit Osamequin, who treaties, who signs the first treaty with European settlers in North America. Um, and it's a mutual defense treaty. It isn't a Kumbaya Thanksgiving treaty. Treaty. It's a, you know, Poconocet, um, we, we want to uh, protect you, you'll protect us uh, from what might be common threats um, for, further afield, further to the west and further to the north. So it was a mutual defense agreement. Um, and it was in place for 54 years until the outbreak of King Philip's War, when Osamequin's son, uh, Poe Medicom, known, known to us as Philip, he leads a coalition of indigenous nations, including former enemies of the Poconocet, like the Narragansett, um, uh, in, in an uprising against uh, English settlements in the United Colonies. And indeed, it almost worked. Uh, the, uh, many, many colonial settlements were burned. Uh, many, many dozens, hundreds of people lost their lives. And in fact, if you do the calculations, uh, King Philip's War remains uh, the bloodiest contest, the bloodiest military um, war ever undertaken in North America in terms of per capita losses. So uh, it, it was an existential threat. What King Philip, what Medicom uh, was um, you know, proposing was an existential threat uh, to New England. And New England began to organize and by the end, end of summer of 1676 had the indigenous coalition on the ropes, and indeed, it was August 12, 1676, that Medicom, uh, this you know guerrilla warrior, this um, pan-indigenous uh, uh, war um, leader, was assassinated at again Patumtuck, two miles up the road. Uh, he had been hunted down by Colonel Benjamin Church, um, and was actually shot in the back by a Christianized indigenous person uh, who uh, had been working with Church. He wasn't unique, many Christ Christian Indians, or so-called praying Indians, were um, also fighting on the side of the English during King Philip's War. So this was a, a tremendous event. Um, like the Sagamore said, uh, early maps uh, of the region, like this 1675 John Seller depiction, would show Poconocet country, uh, right about, this is Narragansett Bay right here, so right about in our neck of the woods, Right, this map is quite old, so the uh, cartography is a little bit uh, aspirational or, or gesture. But uh, you can see clearly their evidence. There are other, other maps that we could show as well. Um, here's a depiction from the 19th century, so already entering a kind of uh, nostalgic mode for settler depictions of indigenous warriors. Uh, but this is interesting because it, it sets up Etacom here with Patumtuck in the background. Uh, which if you've ever looked over to Mount Hope, it doesn't look like that prominent a hill, um, but it was once more prominent than it is now, and I'll get to that story uh, towards the end. Uh, so the King Philip's War was a, was a it, it was an earthquake to New England society um, uh, on both sides of the equation, right? And the indigenous side certainly, uh, and also uh, on, the, on the settler side. By colonial decree, like the Sagamore said, all native people uh, were removed first from Plymouth Colony, which is essentially everything east of where we are in Bristol, all the way over to, um, including the Cape, all the way over to the ocean. And males 14 years or older could be shot on sight, especially if they avowed Poconocet identity. But that's not the whole story, because in the 1670s and 1680s, in the aftermath of King Philip's War, many Poconocet survivors, those who weren't shot on sight or who fell during the war, were sold into slavery in Bermuda, in the Azores, possibly also into the Caribbean, possibly into the Carolinas. Uh, the research here is, um, is emerging even as we speak. Um, we also know that others were sent to the Chetucket Reservation near Norwich, Connecticut, which is in Mohegan territory. And there they were uh, put under the, the, um, the sort of stewardship of a reverend, James Finch, um, and also uh, were sort of um, victim, not victimized, they were uh, subject to um, Mohegan oversight as well. But uh, the oral tradition is very clear that we never lost our identity, even though if we identified as Poconocet out loud, we could be shot, even though we were sort of, you know, 
low low on a, on on the ranking right in in a, an indigenous sort of refugee camp um, we still knew who we were and we still continued uh, to um, to preserve that identity um, in addition a group of Pocono pits uh, evaded uh, being dislocated uh, they, they were able to resettle in an area uh, now in Seekonk Massachusetts people who were with the uh, the warrior the, the head warrior uh, Anawan who was uh, um, Poe Medicom's basically right-hand man during King Philip's War he was captured by church taken to Plymouth, taken to Boston, sorry, and killed. Um, but people who were with him at this last gasp, uh, last moment of the King Philip War, actually settled in Seekonk, Massachusetts, far enough away from Plymouth and Boston, and Providence for that matter, to basically escape view. And, and their descendants are still, you know, with us today and are part of the Poconocet uh, nation. So um, Poconocet oral history is very clear on this point, that with the, with the turn of the 17th into the 18th century, beginning of the 1700s, they were forced to go underground and become effectively an invisible tribe. Um, and some, just to kind of put some things in context, I know I'm talking about a lot of different places. This map, some of those places in southeastern New England. We've got Patumtuck right here, basically where campus is. Uh, we've got uh, contemporary, uh, federally recognized groups, Aquina and Mashpee Wampanoag, located on the Cape and Martha's Vineyard. Plymouth, of course, is over here. The Seekonk Indians, those descendants from Anawan, uh, the Anawan captives are here in Seekonk. Uh, the Chetucket Reservation out here in Norway. South Providence will figure importantly in the next chapter of Poconocet history, especially neighborhoods in and around Mashapog Pond. And again, for reference, the Narragansett Reservation, the contemporary Narragansett Reservation is here in Charlestown, Hopkinton area. Um, Never through the centuries to come after uh, King Philip's War did the Poconocet relinquish their identity or um, forget that Potumtuk, what we know as Mount Hope, is their spiritual high grounds. Now, Potumtuk itself was essentially seized uh, by four Boston land speculators in 1680 by means of a turf and twig ceremony, which is a medieval land conveyance ceremony whereby you would dig, dig a piece of tur uh, turf ground uh, out, of, out of the ground with a shovel, break a twig, put a little bit of money in the turf, uh, where in the hole that you've, 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 you've dug, cover it back up, someone else would come along, your business partner, take the money out, put the turf back down, and now the land to which you were referring is private domain, it's no longer uh, terra nullius or no man's land uh, it is, is is private and that's essentially how all of Bristol became um, able to be carved into house lots able to be um, settled right um, with proprietors with renters with folks moving in etc right and so it was never sold traded or ceded by treaty you could say it was conquered um, but um, one would have to get into a kind of debate about the legal justification for, for that um, at the time and indeed to the present. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is a very important point that comes out clearly in, in Poconocet understandings of Patumtuk, um, that it's a deeply important place. Again, a place of high counsel, a place of spiritual significance, but that it was stolen, um, never traded, sold, or ceded away. Moving ahead line in the late 1700s, so the 18th century, um, a notable descendant of Poe Medicom, his great grandson, Simeon Simons, becomes a bodyguard, an aide de camp for General Washington during the Revolutionary War. He's you know, crossing the Delaware with George Washington in that very famous moment, also uh, spends the winter of 1777 at Valley Forge. Um, so this is a, a, a man of some repute and renown who, whom Washington in his writings knows um, that, that Simons is Native American. He knows that he is uh, Algonquin, uh, as George Washington refers to him. Um, Simons himself knew that he was a descendant, of course, of King Philip. I don't know, no one knows, we would only have to conjecture whether Simons ever vouchsafed that information to Washington. My guess is no, because of the, uh, you know, the, the fear associated with that name, Poconocet. Uh, that fear that was intergenerational by that by that time. Moving ahead a hundred years uh, in the late 1800s, 1870s, 1880s, many of the Chetucket uh, reservation 
uh, Poconoket, who, who by that time had moved away from the Chetucket Reservation but was still in Eastern Connecticut, began to move back to Rhode Island uh, in part to seek jobs in urban factories. And this is where uh, Mashapog Pond, uh, the, the uh, areas of South Providence, uh, but other places and other cities in our region um, would be places where you know, native peoples, uh, Poconoke people specifically, were relocating. As they do, they come under the realm or come under the kind of um, watchful eye of census takers and um, sort of, you know, the, the documentary needs of the state. So uh, often folks at that time were, you know, assuming that all the native peoples were gone from New England, because that's part of the kind of mythos, uh, would see someone who was clearly presenting as maybe not white, right, and would write down colored or black or sometimes white, uh, but never a Poconoke, never very rarely Native American. And so this kind of miscategorization uh, as a function of the settler colonial assumptions about who you are and where you fit um, was definitely a part of this uh, experience, the Poconoke experience at the time. Um, but as I said, they never relinquished their identity or their, their connection to uh, the line of Massasoit or Samequin down through uh, the present. Um, even though, you know, much of the industrializing and urbanizing uh, American experience in the 19th and early 20th century, um, there, there was very little room for uh, indigenous people. In fact, you know, the, the, our federal government was pursuing a policy of, you know, save the man, kill the Indian inside him, right, through um, residential schools and these sorts of things, right? So there was an assimilationist attitude, if not in the Northeast, uh, just a sort of blase, hey, you couldn't possibly be Indian sort of response to Native peoples. Um, nevertheless, Native peoples began to find one another in the kind of cauldron of urbanization and industrialization and intertribal powwows became a thing uh, in the early 1900s. Uh, in, the, in the 1920s, an advocacy group uh, came together with rural and urban Indians called the National Algonquin Indian Council, which advocated in Rhode Island, in Massachusetts, in Connecticut, throughout New England for uh, indigenous um, recognition, right? And they would sponsor powwows, they would sponsor conferences. Uh, Going forth a little bit, a few few decades into the civil rights era, Native groups uh, nationwide under the banner of Red Power uh, begin to demonstrate for their rights. And specifically in our region, uh, again, bringing it up a little bit closer to the present, the Narragansetts organized and gained federal recognition in 1983. State recognition within Rhode Island is a whole different blacks, won't get into it. Um, the Aquina Wampanoag gained federal recognition in 1987 and the Mashpee Wampanoag in 2007. The Poconoket begin to organize among themselves locally here in Rhode Island, great, greater Rhode Island really, um, in the late 1990s um, and currently count 300 tribal members. They do not seek tribal recognition, federal tribal recognition. And that's for a variety of reasons that are really interesting and, and complex, but I'm not, this isn't my story. I'm not the one to say that. Um, we can get into it a little bit in the Q&A, but um, needless to say that their, their trajectory, their reemergence um, out of the shadows or out of the margins tracks with that of other groups, not just in New England, but, but throughout the country and indeed throughout the world. So, Soams today, check the time. Yeah, we're, we're good on time, I think. Um, these are some of the areas that uh, have deep indigenous uh, history and contemporary um, meaning associated with them. I've already mentioned the Seekonk Indians, descendants of the Anawan captives up there in the northern part of the map. Um, the 100 Acre Cove and Soams, these are sort of riverine sites um, that would have been important for, for building villages, but also for gardens, for foraging, for transportation. The Burrs Hill, um, park in Warren. It's a, it's a public park now. It's the burial ground, the royal burial ground of the Poconoket, Sachems, and Massasoit's going back centuries. And then down here at Patumtuck uh, or Mount Hope, the spiritual high grounds, site of Poe Matacom's assassination in 1676. Adjacent to it is a spiritual site called the Three Sisters, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second as well. Um, you can visit these sites, and indeed one that you should visit is the Osamiquin Nature Preserve in Barrington. Um, it is on the western side of, of what, um, of Soams, right? Um, but, but the entire area is Soams. Um, and uh, it, 
is adjacent to the 100 acre cove, which is part of the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, Barrington River, or perhaps that's the Palmer River. Um, but these were transportation lines, vital transportation lines for um, indigenous people going into the inland seasonal migration or, or conducting trade with other tribes and, and other political entities. Um, it, rivers were, streams and rivers were the highways of indigenous people. And um, the Osamico Nature Preserve is a great place to sort of connect with what um, some of Osamequan 17th century landscape may have, may have looked like, may have been like. Of course, the, the village site is no longer there, uh, but you can imagine a, a mixed use kind of area or corridor um, as you visit. Burr's Hill, um, as I said, a public, heart, uh, public park in Warren. Um, you, you wouldn't know anything about the significance of this place for the Poconoka people were it not for a marker recently placed by the Soams Heritage Area Project, um, which is sort of coordinated by a friend of mine, um, Dave Weed, Dr. Dave Weed, in collaboration with the Poconoka tribe to sort of bring to light what archeologists have known and linguists have known and people who study this stuff have known for a long time, which is that Burr's Hill been a royal burial ground for the Poconoke people for generations and some of those some of those burial sites were desecrated in 1854 when the Providence Bristol and Warren Railroad was built through the area. If you've ever been on the East Bay bike path you have rolled through a burial ground uh, as you go through Burr's Hill um, and again that was you know no, no fault to the bikers no shade on the bikers but um, it was part of the uh, a sort of development uh, program in the mid 19th century that um, just wantonly kind of blitzed through, paved through uh, an indigenous burial ground. But you can you can go there today and uh, and and visit and and try to again with decolonized eyes or colonization begin to connect with another way to, of being in place. Uh, Patumtuk again two miles away. It continues to be a vital importance and and lived in place for the Poconoke people. It's a site of uh, continued ceremonies, such as the one depicted here, the renewing of the covenant, which happens every spring. It's a way that the tribe comes together to connect with the place, to connect with the creator, to connect with the, the ele non-human elements um, that sustain our, our lives and our livelihoods. Um, here again is a, is a depiction of the Sagamore sitting in the seat that his uh, ninth great-grandfather, uh, Poe Medicom certain, uh, certainly sat in, and his father, Massasoit Osamequin, certainly sat in as well. Um, Patumtuk is politically significant, it's historically significant because of King Philip's War, but it's also spiritually significant. These boulders, the three sisters, are explained as being reminders of the gifts of the Creator, specifically the story of how the Creator bestowed upon uh, the Poconoke people, ancestral Poconoke people, the perennial gifts of corn, beans, and squash in the form of goddesses who came down and bestowed um, seeds and food on the people. And then as they were going away um, back to the creator, left their mark uh, on the shore so that no one could ever forget, no one could ever deny that corn, beans, and squash were gifts of the creator. So these are the last footprints before the three sisters alight uh, to rejoin the creator. Um, a place where uh, the Pocono could celebrate several Nakomo uh, lunar Thanksgivings, um, in addition to uh, the, um, the renewal of the harvest, uh, the Pionese Warriors Walk, uh, which is a, a type of vision quest. Many, many, many sacred rituals and, and happenings happen in this place, but they don't have title to this place, so they have to ask permission from the actual owners to even come onto the land. That in and of itself, uh, maybe is a, a talk for a different hour. I wanna kinda almost wrap up now by just showing you uh, a Potomtuck from the sky. I mentioned earlier that it was taller than it is now. Uh, in 1956, uh, a good 30 or so vertical feet of clearance of this rocky outcropped mountain, which is described in the colonial text as being like treeless at the top, that was shaved off to level off a Nike Ajax missile uh, battery. Uh, these were anti-aircraft um, surface to air uh, missiles that were installed all up and down the East Coast as part of an early warning system uh, during the, the Cold War. And so you can see King Philip's seat, 
Uh, the arrow indicates approximately where it is. It's in the trees at the eastern base of the hill. The, the, the missile base that you see is actually up on top of the hill. Uh, and to the north, what's left on your screen, uh, the arrow is pointing to the Haffenreffer estate, which is built by Rudolf Haffenreffer, a Brown University alum and um, philanthropist and industrialist who made his name first by brewing Narragansett beer uh, back in the late 19th century uh, up at the Jamaica Plain Brewery, which it currently is condos, I think. Um, in any event, made lots and lots of money, um, had a passion for antiquities, had a passion for Native American um, uh, collections and, and, and paraphernalia. So he began a museum at his estate. Uh, and, and upon his passing, he deeded his many acres estate in, in addition to the Anthropological Museum to his alma mater, to Brown University. And to this day, much of what is depicted here is Brown University property. The, the army decamped um, in 1974. There are some private residences up uh, in that area of the hill these days. Uh, and then to the south, which is right on your screen, uh, is the Mount Hope uh, Farm property, which is um, uh, townland. Another interesting tidbit here is that there, this exact area down uh, where the Haffenreffer estate is and with stone's throw of King Philip's seat, uh, the seat of Medicom, uh, there was a, an amusement park, nothing more American than that, um, 1884 to 1901, which was accessible mostly to the Fall River clientele via a ferry that crossed Mount Hope Bay. Many Bristolians uh, didn't really uh, think too highly of an amusement park, and so they didn't make the trip over. Medicom Avenue at that time was was a dirt path, <laughs> right? So you didn't have Roger Williams University. It was, it was still Ferry Cliff Farm, um, and you didn't have the kind of um, 20th century development that you have along Medicom Avenue um, at that time. So, Bristol today, we clearly celebrate the colonial era. We celebrate US independence. Uh, we're, we're loud and proud about that when it comes time for 4th of July. Right here on this welcome sign, which is basically on our campus. This is at the foot of the Mount Hope Bridge when you're going north. It says, welcome to Bristol, settled, six, settled 1680. Um, no mention of the turf and twig uh, conveyance, no mention of um, land theft, uh, but there is mention of the home of America's oldest 4th of July celebration. Now, I, I don't necessarily, you know, I, I'm not a, play, a town booster, that's not my job. So, you know, the folks who wanna boost the town, they have their, their means and they have their reasons, and this is a perfectly fine welcome sign. Um, if you keep digging and keep going throughout the town though, you'll see plenty of kind of monuments and and uh, tributes to um, colonial figures like this tablet on the right, erected by the Rhode Island Society of Colonial Wars in recognition of the exceptional services rendered by Colonel Benjamin Church, his fearless leadership, effective command during King Philip's War. He certainly was fearless, he was effective. Um, King Philip died, um, the indigenous insurgency was, was, and you've been caught up on that story. Uh, after King Philip's War, Benjamin Church continued to lead a relatively colorful life. He went up and fought in King William's War against the Abenaki um, and, uh, you know, to, to great fame as well. Um, and he was one of those original proprietors of Bristol, uh, settled in 1680. In fact, Church Street, uh, you, might, you might notice that there's no church on Church Street in Bristol because it's na named after Benjamin Church. Um, it's adjacent to a church, but it was originally laid out as, as in, in honor of Benjamin Church. So these are the ways in which, um, you know, once we start to think about, okay, the very things that are the fabric of our society are themselves the after effects or the continually recreated effects of colonialism, that then we can begin to understand how difficult it is to, to take on the information, to, to really um, think about the indigenous perspective because it's it's always already pushed to the margin. Um, so one thing that we've been doing, this is the last slide, we'll open it up. Um, again, over the past year, uh, students of mine in the honors program and in the anthropology and sociology program, in partnership with the tribe, in partnership with the Friends of the Poconoke, um, she won collaborative, which is an interesting community and university collaborative that sprung up in the past year here on campus. We've been trying to inform people here in the East Bay about this story, about the story of this invisible tribe. Um, and the challenge, of course, is that many people have heard about King Philip's War, um, but they sort of think that's the end, 
right? That's the end of Indigenous um, issues here in, or Indigenous people, period, here in the East Bay of Rhode Island. Maybe they've heard about the Wampanoag in, in Mashpee. Uh, maybe they've heard about casinos in Taunton. Maybe they've heard about the Aquina. Certainly, they probably heard about the Narragansett, and justifiably so. But the Poconoka continue in some ways to be an invisible tribe occluded from, from the histories that we tell, in, in large part because of the continued legacies of colonialism and being continually punished for having the Poconoka leadership take that leading role in uh, an anti-indigenous or anti-colonial, sorry, insurgency in the King Philip's War. And so the, the booklet, which I encourage all of you to look at, there's also a website, um, maybe uh, Professor Hendrickson shared it in the chat already, um, can give you some of this history and give you other resources to, to consult about it as well. Um, this is a long uh, struggle to try to um, overcome what has been centuries really of misinformation or half-truths or uh, settler colonial ideology, right? To try to attenuate that, address that, rework it um, is, is tough stuff. But there's room for everybody to do it. And so thank you all for listening to me do some of this work, again, from a settler's perspective. Um, it's been my privilege and honor to speak um, to you all tonight. It's been my privilege and honor to bear some of the story that the Poconocet entrusted me with. So I wanna thank the, the Sagamore, um, Winds of Thunder. I wanna uh, thank the Sachem Dancing Star, Tribal Council President, Running Deer. Thanks to Dave Weed, to Laura D. Moore, Laura Turner, Jason Jacobs, Margaret Everett, um, my students, the Honors Program, the Heritage Harbor Foundation, which helped us print all of these, um, and the Wuchiwami uh, Living Culture Collaborative. Thank you all. And now we've got time for questions. So I'm gonna jump in here really quick, just to make sure, because I got like four or five sentences of what I think are like really pressing or core questions that I'd like to pose to you, Dr. Campbell. Um, the first one was actually one of our first questions that comes from Spencer Wright. And I think it's um, so important because uh, ultimately this is about you learning about things as well too. And uh, Spencer asked, what surprised you the most when conducting your research for this presentation? And, and what I'm thinking, I'm gonna, you're like, you're, I'm holding you to like one to two minute. Sure. Answer, Good. Okay? We've got like four or five good questions I want to ask you. Yeah. What surprised me most, thank you, Spencer, for the question. What surprised me most was how underprepared I was as a professionally trained anthropologist to appreciate the political complexity, to appreciate the intergenerational trauma that um, Pocon not just Poconoke, but indigenous people, especially in the East Coast, have had to confront, have had to deal with. Uh, the people with whom I work in the Amazon are uh, be, being very clearly colonized, right? And there's a clear, like, look, there, there's, those folks with guns want to kill us, right? Or the, the government wants to actively remove us from this place. Here, far more subtle, far more complicated. Um, so that was, I, I wasn't prepared for that. I also wasn't prepared for the incredible generosity of our indigenous interlocutors and collaborators in um, opening their homes, opening their hearts, their archives to the kind of work that my students and, and I and other people on campus are doing. So, so both of those things were kind of, wow, I don't know how to do this work, not prepared for it, but also, wow, here are people who are just incredibly generous. Thank you. So I'm gonna actually foreground a question from uh, Connor Goggin that came later on, but I think it's important in terms of really thinking about the, uh, the critical issues here. So. Um, and also from a more historical perspective as we get into more contemporary issues, um, is it as black and white as colonists came here and slaughtered natives, quote unquote, or did natives retaliate and or was the peace for a significant amount of time? Okay, um, I think the first way into it is to say no, it's not as simple as um, colonists coming and slaughtering native peoples. In fact, for the, the you know, generation and a half or two generations of English settlement, and for that matter, Dutch settlement, and for that matter, Swedish settlement, the 17th century up and down the East Coast, Spanish settlement in the Southeast, um, 
those uh, colonial undertakings in North America were very fragile, very precarious. And, um, you know, we, we have evidence that suggests that indigenous sachems and, and, and leaders knew this. They knew that, you know, we, we could eliminate these right early on, right? And so the peace was a, was a mutually productive peace, the one at least between uh, Osamequin, right, the Poconoke Massasoit, and the early pilgrims, that was a mutually productive, mutually beneficial peace. Um, the problem was that, you know, within the next 50 years, 30, 30 to 50,000 other English folks showed up, right? And, um, you know, Europe was um, sort of, you know, um, not over, overpopulated, but there was a population boom in Europe uh, in the 17th uh, and continued through the 18th and 19th century. So um, there were just many people. Um, there were some technological advantages too that help explain kind of how a piece uh, that was mutually kind of conducive and beneficial turned sour, right? I don't know if that addresses the question, but it is, it is incredibly complicated. And you have, to, you have to kind of understand that things are kinetic throughout history, right? At one particular moment, there might be a sort of uh, collaboration or a kind of meeting of the minds, wait a generation or two, and things may be very different because of economic, political, social, climatic changes. One of the main impacts, and this story is often not told, the main kind of ways through which the English colonized New England was by changing the landscape, um, by, uh, by, by introducing pigs. Pigs would, you know, run wild and eat Native American gardens of, of corn, beans, and squash, leaving Native Americans with very little to eat. Of course, there's the um, introduction, of new, uh, introduction of new pathogens as well, um, which is a kind of ecological factor that uh, was in the Europeans' favor. Um, introducing things like debt, introducing things like currency. Wampum is usually thought of as a currency, but it, it wasn't. It was a way of, of, of marking status, a way of, of, of actually making reciprocal relationships happen between and among Native peoples, it became debased as a currency once the Europeans arrived. And so that changed the ecology and it changed the, the way in which folks were um, relating to their environment. So it was complex, to be sure. So I'm gonna jump ahead because we have a lot of questions about this and I've tried to synthesize them all and I'm not even gonna read you the paragraph of my synthesis, but I'm gonna say, a lot of questions about mascots, okay? And I think there's two major points. Is like, um, what do we do about mascots? Are people gonna change their minds about mascots? And then also, yes. when you have a tribe, and this is coming from somebody who was an undergrad at Florida State, yeah. um, criminals, right, that has a relationship with the university that seems to problematize, at least on a surface level, this idea that, um, uh, we should just say all indigenous American Indian Native American mascots are problematic. We should get all rid of them. And then should should we just, like what do we do? What do we do? Do we say they're all bad? Do we have a more nuanced perspective? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think, um, and I've thought a lot about this over the years. Um, I think that our default should be to um, hear. Um, perspectives as opposed to go to a defensive mode, which seems to have been the way that uh, defenders of the former um, mascot for the Washington football team always did it, right? It was like, we, we come with a defense. Uh, part of being decolonial or part of doing decolonial work is really opening up to other perspectives and being willing to learn from them and not searching for maybe the one or two, because this is something that the front office at the Washington football team always used to do. They would search for one or two people of Native American blood, right? And say, I find it to be respectful. And there you go, you're both sides it, right? Which is, which is a terrible intellectual habit that 21st century North Americans learn early and we have to unlearn, right? Because uh, that's, that's not, it's not he said, he said, we, or he said, she said something different and we agree to disagree and we have this thing that does this kind of epistemic violence, right? Um, cartoonish mascots kind of normalize a cartoonish throwaway kind of regard for Native American realities. And so provided they're doing that work, they all got to go, in, in my view, right? Now, the, the interesting example of the Seminole, um, if, and there, it's, it's, not, it's not unique to FSU, there are ones in Oklahoma, there, there are ones in uh, certainly the Southwest, um, mascots at the high school level, at the junior college level, at the, at the college level that are 
respectful and appropriate because they reflect the community itself. There's an open dialogue about who constitutes that community. There's an open, far, far more than just a land acknowledgement, an open partnership with people around and about these kinds of issues. To say nothing of Native Hawaiians and Native Alaskans as well, where, where those kinds of things happen. Um, but chiefs, um, warriors, uh, these kinds of things. Um, look at the Golden State Warriors, right? They've, they've certainly cleaned up their imagery, right? But they started as a racist and offensive. Almost all Warriors uh, mascots started as 100 years ago, 120 years ago, super offensive, right? With the times they've changed and maybe Warriors is fine, right? Um, but it would be, I, I would invite all of you to, again, think of history as emergent. Think of these um, things that happened in the past as not just being over with, but instead research the history of maybe your high school or you know some local mascot um, and ask yourself if any indigenous person was ever consulted, right? Ask yourself the general attitude towards indigenous rights and indigenous peoples in your place, in your town, at the time that sports were established, which is probably the late 19th, early 20th century. And then you'll get a little bit of the mindset, a little bit of a glimpse in the threshold mindset at the at you know at the start of um, competitive sports in your town, and and maybe then there's a conversation about whether we want to continue this or if we want to again set it in context, recontextualize it. I don't want to be sort of as all you know really stern about this, except to say that you know we do have to take this seriously and not just reject it as oh those people can't take a joke. That means you if if you respond in that way. I think you're, you're, you're not doing the best work you can to listen and open up to a different perspective. All right, so um, I've got at least two more that I tried to synthesize over the time and for those folks who are, are spilling questions and uh, you know, we'll see if we can attend to those. But um, one of them is about you know, what's happening at the K through 12 level to correct the, um, the way in which we conflate Wampanoag with Poconoke. So that's one level. The other part of this is um, how can we claim to be addressing these things when we still treat Thanksgiving the way we do, when we still call Columbus Day, Columbus Day. Um, and, um, and then like, what can a, a normal person who's, who's not hoping that the, they're beyond public education, the public education system is gonna fix things for them, where do they go to be able to find out good information? So that's a huge question and just, and I'm giving you like literally like one to two minutes. So tackle sure. that. So K to 12 is a, is a vital strategic place. Um, and it's a place that I think is relatively open. You know, nothing, nothing changes overnight. Um, but through small victories, through, you know, uh, a middle school uh, history teacher who is interested in stuff and is interested in learning more, I think there can be a lot of success um, in correcting the record, not just a kind of distinction between Poconokan and Wampanoag, but really correcting on a fundamental level, teaching indigenous issues in the present tense, which speaks to, I think, the concern with Thanksgiving. We tend to have a kind of, we have cultural trappings and them associated with the day, but then we also teach about it. It's a hook in for a lot of middle school history, and it's just done really poorly and often leaves if, if it leaves uh, the learners with a sense of injustice having been perpetrated on indigenous peoples, fine, that's, that's good. But if it then says past tense and doesn't continue to talk about a vital portion of our republic, a vital thread in our national history, which is indigenous communities, then we're doing a disservice. So that has to happen throughout the curriculum. And I think it can, I'm hopeful that that can happen. Um, it's not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen top down, it happens bottom up, community by community. It happens by taking resources like these and, and introducing this, uh, these pamphlets and these resources to other um, I would say the internet offers us a lot, of the, a lot of the ability to get this information. That's true, but the internet, you know, be careful, right? Because there's a lot of misinformation there too. So we have good tools for distributing information. Um, there's some strategic places where we probably have to focus more. Um, Part in the fact that these questions, this generation is more interested in issues of equity and justice and inclusion. Um, you know, it's Halloween too, not being uh, some kind of terribly racist, stereotypical, indigenous, or et cetera, uh, sort of um, pantomime for Halloween. That's another place where we can nip it in the bud and just kind of expect better of other people too, I think. 
So I'm going to try to combine two questions. One of them came very early on from uh, Dr. Murphy, and then I think one of them is from uh, Honor, one of our students, and I think maybe I can synthesize these. So Honor is asking, what do the Poconokit want us to do about this legacy of colonization? Do they want reparations? Do they want us to get off their land? And I think in an interesting connection to other issues that are going on, Dr. Murphy asks, like, uh, like how, uh, what, I'm going to read this. What is the word you would use to describe the parallel process between blacks and whites in our country? So I think in this moment, for those of us who are um, white folks trying to attend to a legacy of racism and exploitation, like what are we, and I think that there's a unique question with indigenous folks, and maybe there's a broader question about what we do to be anti-racist in this moment. Right. And would you be willing to maybe suss that out to sort of end the conversation for us tonight? I would, yeah. Um, let me try to take the first one first. Um, what, what do the Poconokid want? Um, one, one thing that the Poconokid want that's very concrete is to not be ignored um, and to not be um, sort of treated in the past tense, right? And so how, how do we do that? We, we make sure that there are public events. We make sure that there are strategic ways of communicating with the broader public um, uh, so, so that their story gets out there. Another thing that they want that's very specific and material is Patumtuk, Mount Hope. Um, they, they want to not have ask permission to go on to land that they see and that they've always understood as being their spiritual high. Um, whether that takes the shape of a reservation or um, a trust kind of arrangement, uh, whether it's just in Brown and the town's property um, and uh, the Poconoke kind of manage it. Um, I don't know, and uh, no one knows, right? But the current situation is untenable for the Poconoke. And so, um, you know, if, if, if that matters to you, then pay attention to that story and do what you can uh, go, going along, I think. And, and respect, respecting that the tribe is in the driver's seat when it comes to that, right? Um, there are no um, 18 to 22 year old Roger Williams student saviors, right, for the Poconoke, right? But, but really taking on this story, repeating it, um, trying to analyze it, trying to converse about it, bringing it to light, that I think goes a long way. Um, the broader resonance for, um, you know, um, Black Lives Matter and um, anti-racist work is that I think it's, it's important that we all undertake, uh, whether it's decolonization or anti-racist work, I mean, they, they certainly <laughs> overlap, right? And, and maybe you could say one is squarely rooted in the other or vice versa. But um, I think it's especially important for dominantly positioned members of our society um, to speak out on this, to not lead, but to speak out and model that these kinds of ways of taking for granted settler truisms or white supremacist truisms about who we are as a people and what we value, they're here for white people. They're here for, for, for settlers. They're here for dominantly positioned people. So if you, if you value diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, if you want to dedicate yourself to decolonial work or anti-racist work, you have to dis dismantle some of the things that have given you um, relative ease. Now, you can be creative about how that looks, and I'm not saying full-on communism, full-on anarchy, anything like that, but that we really do need to grapple with the kinds of assumptions that we, that we might not know are, are stamped with white supremacy or, or that are stamped in, a, in colonial oppression. One quick example is how the hell, when, when the hell did it become okay for people born and educated in the United States to use the word America to refer to the United States. And many of you are probably like, what? I live in America, I'm American. Well, you live in the United States of America, right? And America is a word, a, it's an Eastern Hemisphere word that routes to Amerigo Vespucci that refers to North America and South America. And people grow up in Mexico, in Brazil, in Argentina, in Peru, thinking of themselves as Americans as distinct from Europeans, as distinct from, quote, right? And so America doesn't mean just one thing, right? And so pluralizing our ability to understand that places have different stories, that peoples have different truths, right? Uh, but that at the end of the day, we can't just take our toys and go home if we, don't, if we don't agree with one another. The planet's getting hotter. There are a lot of us, 
and we got to get along. And so how do we build that emotional vocabulary? How do we build that, you know, um, empathetic uh, sort of musculature to be able to connect with people, even if we're not the same and, and establish some things and, and, and um, accomplish some things um, within, a, within a political society, right? I think that's the challenge. And, and decolonization get, gives us some of the tools to rework things so that we're more inclusive and more just anti-racism work does it as well. But it's for dominantly positioned people to play a big, not just, you know, okay, it's diversity hour, let's see, you know, um, black, indigenous, and people of color, um, and we'll sort of, you know, gently and politely clap and then not really consider our own stakes in the systems that we benefit from. That, that, that it? That's a wrap? <laughs> okay. Well, um, yeah, I see that we still have quite a few people here. Thank you very much for having me on. Um, there are probably lots of other questions. Um, you can hit me up at J.M. Campbell, uh, J-M-C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L -L at rwu.edu. My office is down in Stonewall 4. Wear a mask, send me an email. We can set up a time to chat if you're curious and interested in these matters um, or in others as well. Again, I work in the Amazon, so if you're interested in the Amazon, hit me up there too. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hendrickson. Thank you, Provost Everett. Thank you, Dr. Diamore. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Thank you, Dean Jacobs. Thank you all. And thank you, uh, Poconoke people as well for uh, the trust you placed in me. Have a good night, guys.